Hello everyone, welcome back to my Dragon Quest VI 100% walkthrough. Joining me as usual is my friend Skyzo. How you doing? I'm doing well. Hello YouTube. Now, first thing we're gonna do, and this is what we would have done last episode, had I a slime in my party and I was able to get the small medals from the Slimopolis, is we are going to get the Miracle Sword, the Hourglass of Time, or the Sands of Time, and then we're going to get the Sacred Armor. The Sword of Miracles is one of the strongest swords of the game, but most importantly, every bit of damage you do with it, you get 50% of your HP back from it. Or, you regenerate 50% of the amount of damage you do. The Sands of Time, you can use it to rewind time and restart the battle. In the Super Nintendo, you only get to use it once. In the remakes, you get to use it infinitely. And finally, the Sacred Armor is one of the strongest pieces of armor in the game. It has no resistances, but whoever wears it regenerates 50 hit points a turn. What do you think of that, Skyzo? So when you have the armor and the sword, are you just going to get 100 hit points uh, returning for you every turn? Not exactly 100 hit points. You get 50 hit points, and then you get 50% of whatever amount of damage you deal to an enemy. So if you do 4 hit points, you get 2 back. If you do 1000 hit points, you get 500 back. If you do 100 hit points, you get 50 hit points back. That makes sense? Yeah, so pretty much uh, a lot of the time, really, you'll be getting at least 100. Well, not always, but a lot back. Um, it completely negates the effects of double-edged slash. Well, not completely, but it helps negate the effects of double-edged slash. Anyway, now for one of the dumbest minigames I think I have ever seen in a Dragon Quest game. You are going to see why. It's the only place where our style points come into play, and it is not worth it. It is not worth it at all. So what are, you, what are we trying to gain in this, in this minigame? We are trying to get a plush rug, which can be done in this best dressed contest level three. And eventually we're going to want to get the Sage's Stone from it as well at level seven. Pay attention to all the, uh, well, or read the description. See what I'm equipping, and that's what will give you the most style points. Um, think of the Pokemon contests, but with all the interesting stuff taken out of it. All of the gameplay. Um, so do you just put on the pieces that give you the most points? Is that it? Yep. And I am going to show you how to do this minigame. See, first, a text box will come up. You press A, and then an animation plays. Now, there's a second text box, and you have to press A again. Now, after this, there's going to be a third text box. And then you have to press A, you see. Now, now, watch this now, watch this now. A fourth text box. You gotta make sure to press A the same way you did before. And then comes another. And then you have to press down on the arrow pad. And then you have to press up. That does it. This just sounds like a Kon uh, just Konami code. It is rather dumb, isn't it? Well, I don't really 
really see the point of it if you can just memorize what you have to do. Like, how would you know that this is what you have to do to win? I am being heavily sarcastic. It's the only thing you can do. And there's nothing else that goes into this? Nope! Nothing else! That's pretty dumb, then. It is pretty dumb. And we have to do that six more times in order to get everything that we want. Really? So it's just... Wow, so just sit and wait and do it every time. Yep. Now, the only wrinkle to this is that if you wear certain combinations of equipment, you can get a boost to your style, a hidden boost that you only find out about once you get to the end of this. And I don't really know how you're supposed to know the exact combinations, but at least for this point in the game, all you really need to do is get the Miracle Sword and uh, Sacred Armor together. You'll get a 40 point boost from that. And I'm just showing some treasure that I missed before. And other than that, it's just, I'm just gonna use Dissolve Effects to show what we got. There you go. That was like seven minutes I edited out. That sounds incredibly tedious. Thanks for skipping that. <laughs> it was as much my pleasure as, as it was yours. Now let's go do something funner, shall we? Let's go visit a dungeon. What are we gonna do? Well... First, we're going to put nothing but Carver in the lead with his regenerating armor. Now, the smarter thing to do would be to put Carver along with Ashlyn and I think Nevin. Basically two guys that you don't care if they die because like for the most part, Carver is invincible here. Like, he basically cannot die. But there is one enemy that can stun him with nu numbing breath. And when your entire party gets paralyzed in this game, that's an instant game over. Really? That's strange. Yeah, it is how it is. But check out his HP. No, wait. Okay, bad example. Those enemies can send people out of your party. They don't have instant death spells. They don't do a lot of damage. They just remove the characters entirely. So you'd have to go back to Dharma Temple or All Trades Abbey and get them back. Also, check out his HP regen. It sounds like he can't die. Like you said. Basically. So, there's only one monster here that has that numbing breath, and if I recall, it's fairly low accuracy. Like, it only has a 30% chance of actually paralyzing you, it's just, if it lands, it can spell game over. So, the only reason I'm having Carver go solo is basically for the memes. For the fun of it. I imagine it would also speed things up, since you would presumably die and get back to your last checkpoint. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would speed things up if I don't die along the way. It's what speedruns do at any rate. It's just not what I typically do in a casual run. Speedrunners do in this case. Do they do this? They do this just for menuing speed, even though it's slightly riskier than having two meat shields. Okay, 
That's interesting. Essentially, the meat shields are there so that just in case the numbing breath paralyzes Carver, you still have a few others that can run from the fight. And then you'll recover from that paralysis afterwards. Okay, gotcha. Actually, there is another reason why I want him to go solo. It's, uh... <laughs> it's about two and a half minutes from now, and it's, uh... It's pretty special. I can't wait to show you. Oh, I'm thinking it's, like, hidden dialogue. You'll see. Also, get this mini metal. It's pretty hidden. Oh, there's the monster. You see that green guy on the left? Yep. That is the one monster with the numbing breath that could doom this uh, party. In fact, this is one of the only parts that I actually re-recorded because I think on my very first attempt, he actually did manage to stun Carver and wipe me out. Like, this here is, like, one of the very few things that that I actually redid before the start of this. Okay, well, that should get a show that it's a risky strategy. Yeah, which is why you'd have two other guys with you. Not because Carver can be beaten with brute strength, but because of that numbing breath. There's a 30% chance, so I wouldn't be too concerned. Yeah, it's not too bad, just something to note. Alright, ready for the next Dread Fiend? Sure, let's see. Let's fight it. You know, Murdaw was like the toughest guy ever. Jamiris can sometimes be a handful too. Let's see what this guy has to offer. That's a male? I thought it was. Maybe he's female. Okay, it is female, okay. No, That's... I said maybe it is. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> is... Alright, so get upper on yourself. Max out your defense, and uh, you've won. You can't do anything? Nope. So the thing of it is, this guy only attacks once per round. Unlike Murdaw, who could attack one to two times, and Jamiris, who could attack one to two times, this guy can only do it once. Now he makes up for that, or is supposed to, with AoEs that can do around 70 points of damage to everyone. The thing of it is, that cannot overpower our 50 regen. And even if it could, we have the Staff of Gen. So he can never actually exceed 70 points of damage per round. So if we're just fighting him with one guy, he can't beat us. There we go! You can just, you can just imagine what, he, what that thing was thinking, finding a guy that can't die. It made Guile's theme pretty appropriate, don't you think? For sure. So, um, and I think, actually, even amongst casual players, he's this guy's kind of infamous for being really easy for where he's at. I think the idea was it's supposed to be more of a battle of attrition. Like, Jamiris swung for the fences. The third test in the Hallowed Hallow beat you down with Kassaps. And Murdaugh was just a jack of all trades of everything. He was a trickster that went in a semi-fixed pattern and 
through a lot of powerful magic. I think this guy was supposed to be an endurance match, because he doesn't hit very hard, but he has 3,000 HP, which is a lot for this point in the game. The thing of it is, though, you have infinite healing even without the mystic armor. The Staff of Ghent, I think, heals around 60 to 80 or 70 to 90. And you can get something else called the Power Shield from a tough dungeon that can do the same thing. So it's not even the mystic armor being broken. It's just him being really, really weak. Well, on the one hand, I'm kind of glad that he's kind of weak since an endurance fight is about the most boring fight you can pretty much have in these kinds of games. It's just waiting. Indeed. And I don't know, maybe it just wasn't playtested. Like, if that's just my theory, it could just be that, like, this part of the game was kind of unfinished and they just, like, forgot to tweak the guy. Well, I mean, they did work on, like... I wouldn't fault them for that, to be honest, since it's... It's way too much to keep track of. That's true. Anyway, beating him makes this continent come back to the dream world. Calbarona, or Sorceria, they sealed it away because there's an uber powerful spell that Ashlyn's gonna learn. Well, not really that powerful, but it's supposed to be. And that's what we're here to do now. Sounds good. Looks like this is a new area as well. I don't remember seeing this. Um, that was something you found in the uh, in that sea castle. So make sure you pick that up right before Gracos himself. Now we're gonna get a cutscene. Okay, let's see. That is an adorable. Look at that hat. It's just so. So what's going on here? She's going to teach her Madante, or magic first. You see, this is Ashlyn's hometown. She's come down with a case of amnesia, and it hasn't until now that we learn that this is where she came from. Now in the real world, the dread fiend Mortimer just raised it to the ground, but it still exists in people's dreams. He tried to counter that by having Gracos seal it away, but we defeated Gracos, and this elder just passed down Magic Burst right as Mortimer killed her. She's dead? Yep. Is she gonna get revived? Nope. I thought you could revive someone like that on a whim. Oh man, don't don't ask questions about that. You're just going to open up more plot holes. Okay, that's fair enough. So, what are you going to do now? Well, first we're going to collect some items. Because this has some good stuff in it as well, and don't worry about that Rex clone. He's not important. No, seriously, he's actually not important. It's just an old man being a clone. We're gonna get some mini medals. We're going to exit the town again. By the way, that's another dreamscape. And we're gonna enter a well and get a prayer ring. And then, you know that plush carpet that we got in the best dressed contest? Oh yeah? We're going to get it enchanted so it can become a flying carpet. Sure, that sounds exciting. It is exciting. Because, now, the flying bed, that was pretty cool. But you see, flying beds only exist in the dream world, because nothing crazy like that ever happens in real life. 
Where'd, so we need to get a magic carpet instead. Catch my drift? I do, and I actually forgot that we were in the dream world, to be honest. Like, if we've been sitting in here so long, it feels like. Hmm. Yep. Actually, I think we were in the real world, but I entered the dream world while you weren't looking. Which I don't blame you for. There's a lot going on. It's... Every second, it's so dense. There's so many things going on, and this run is stylistically designed to be that way. And you can't undo that, but you can diminish the effects of it. Okay. You see that. <laughs> now then, we are going to go to the lower left to visit a church. And I think after around that point is when this episode ends, I think. Let me try to brainstorm real quick, just to be sure that that's accurate. Actually, you're right. It is about the end of the episode. That was very quick, actually. It's always very quick. Just like me. Well, you have to be quick, because there's so much to talk about, right? Yeah. So then, God bless everyone, and see you next episode. Okay, well, see you, YouTube.